Good morning, everybody. This is Kathy Schrock. I'm a retired technology director, and I live on Cape Cod. I now go all around the country and even the world helping teachers seamlessly embed technology meaningfully into teaching and learning. The presentation today is called Following Change to Lead Change. It's all about how you can become a leader by increasing your knowledge of technology and how technology can help teaching and learning. Um, because of the bandwidth constraints, I'm going to shut my camera off, but I'll be back with you at the end of the presentation. See you in a bit. We all know how fast technology is changing, and I hope to provide you with ways to keep up with new information, as well as give you ideas for how to lead, ch lead change in your school or your district. Here's my contact information and the link for the information that I'm going to be covering. I will show this again at the end of the presentation. It's simply schrockguide.net forward slash leading dash change dot html. If you have a QR code reader, you can snap the QR code. As I said, I'll come back to this at the end. I'm going to talk a little bit about becoming the social leader, developing your personal learning network, provide you with tips and tricks to stay ahead of the curve, how to pick the things you use, and how to pay it forward. In the old days, the social leader was the life of the party getting others to follow along, like these two. You remember them from Animal House as they rabble-rouse to get the group to wear togas. However, however, nowadays, the social leader can both reach more people and do it in a more civilized manner. The current definition of a social leader is one who makes use of social media to affect change. Well, that's kind of a tad broad. Use what social media? When and how? The first step in leading change is learning how to follow other social leaders. Developing a personal learning network, commonly called a PLN, is the first step in acquiring the knowledge and information you need to affect change. Alec Chorus offers this illustration of the typical teacher network. Curriculum documents, popular media, and print and digital resources come at them, and they collaborate with colleagues, family, and the local community. The network teacher, on the other hand, still receives curriculum documents and popular media, and still interacts with colleagues in the community, but also winds up interacting and collaborating using a host of tools, including wikis, blogs, social networking sites, social bookmarking, microblogging with Twitter, video conferencing, chatting, and both receiving and creating their own print and digital resources. After this presentation, you too will be on your way to becoming a network teacher. A personal learning network is just that, a network of others who share with you and whom you share with. You go to your PLN for help or to learn new things, and they provide you with support for teaching and student learning. Sue Waters, on her blog way back in 2008, when there were very few personal learning networks, asked educators to answer some questions about their use of personal learning networks. One of the questions she asked was, why is a personal network important to educators? I love this response from Derek Wenworth from New Zealand. A personal learning network allows teachers to help each other solve problems, hear each other's stories, find synergy across structures, keep up with changes, reflect on their practice and improve it, build a shared understanding, find a voice and gain strategic influence, and cooperate on innovation. And Robin Ellis from Pennsylvania stated her heartfelt reason PLNs were important to her. I think the most important part of this are the aspects of connecting, communicating, and collaborating. Sue then took everyone's responses and dumped them into Wordle, which is, you know, is an online word cloud generator, which makes the words that are mentioned more often bigger in the end result. You can see that students, network, teaching, others, help, learning, and sharing wound up being the key things the commenters to her blog post talked about. 
John Spencer, in his blog, provides us with a useful outline of the places where teachers can cultivate their PLN to both learn from others and provide information for others. Social media, multimedia, communities, blogging, in-person relationships, traditional print, and professional development. Let's go through these. Social media is made up of online applications that allow users to create the content and collaborate with others. Two popular social media tools are Twitter and Google+. Twitter is really the most important tool in my PLN toolbox. It's both easy to share and receive information. Some of the key points of Twitter are, it's an online messaging service, kind of like instant messaging, but it is one-to-many as opposed to one-to-one. -to -one. It's not truly synchronous like instant messaging, but it can be pretty close to it. The messages you post on Twitter are public and can be found in a Twitter search by anybody. A Twitter message can only be 140 characters long. And when you sign up for Twitter, users can decide to follow your posts and you can choose to follow the, theirs or both. The most important aspect of Twitter to learn about is how to find experts to follow. The social networking component of Twitter helps with this. Once you find one good person to follow, you look at the per people that that person follows and follow some of those others too. There are also lists of Twitter users by category. One includes wefollow.com, and there are also wikis of Twitter using teachers arranged by teaching topic. So if you currently use Twitter, please go to the Twitter for Teachers wiki and add yourself in the appropriate category so people can follow you. Another useful aspect of Twitter is the use of the hashtag. A hashtag is used in a Twitter message to allow all the messages to be gathered together all in one place. There are hashtags set up for conferences, classrooms, and regular Twitter events like EdChat. Which is, a sponsor, which is an online chat once a week at a certain time on a topic of interest. Again, it's a great way to find people to add to your PLN and offer your thoughts to the discussion. In 2010, George Corus wrote an article outlining what network leaders should tweet about. He had some solid ideas and they're still meaningful. Some that I feel are especially important are educational articles that influence your thinking. If you believe that the article written by an organization or another educator is beneficial to your learning and or the learning of others, make sure you tweet it out. Thoughts and quotes. As leaders, we need to be thinkers. Sometimes it's nice to have a space where we can share these thoughts. Posing questions. Leaders can ask their PLN for ideas, thoughts, successful practices, and get a whole bunch of good feedback and information for themselves or their organization and support other educators. Retweeting, which means sending out a tweet to the people who follow you, is a way of saying that you enjoyed what they shared and you think it's important to pass it on to your own teachers or PLN. Google Plus is a social network where educators are starting to hang out, literally. Since November 2012, this has also been available for Google Apps for Education accounts. In addition to groups you can create and follow, there is a Hangout feature which allows 10 people with cameras and mics to have a conversation. Whoever is speaking shows up in the big video window. In addition, there is now a Google Hangouts on Air, which still allow 10 people in the Hangout, but also broadcasts live so anyone can view it and chat. And when it's all done, it saves the recording to YouTube. In May of 2012, Google held a full-day conference called Edu on Air with over 40 Google Hangouts on Air presentations. By attending an event like this, you can find great people to add to your personal learning network among the presenters and the participants. Multimedia can be part of creating your PLN too. One way to both learn from others and to gain a following of your own is to create or subscribe to a podcast or video series. Now, a podcast is not just an audio file put online. It also contains a special address called a feed address, which allows others to automatically receive the newest versions of someone's podcasts or video cast.
The first thing you need to subscribe to a podcast or videocast is a podcast aggregator such as iTunes. Whether or not you use any Apple products, it's a great organizer of audio and is available to download for both Windows and Mac. People who have podcasts list them in the iTunes podcast store. They're not actually housed in the iTunes store. So that is one place to start looking for podcasts to follow. Here are the audio choices from the education category and the video choices also. Podomatic is another place to find podcasts to follow since they actually host all the podcasts that are created. You can see that they also have an education category. And for yourself, for free with Podomatic, you can create a podcast via your, your phone or computer, or you can upload an audio file. The uploaded file automatically gets that magic feed address that you can share with others or register with iTunes. One of the reasons many educators create videocasts is to demonstrate to students how to do something. A videocast which captures everything on your desktop is usually called a screencast. You can leave this type of instruction in your school. Screencast-O-Matic is a free online screen capture program that allows you to capture up to 15 minutes of audio and video and host it online at YouTube or download it as a flash file, mp4, or AVI file. There are all types of communities you can participate in, both online and offline, to build up your personal learning network and keep ahead of the curve to help hone your leadership capabilities. Offline communities are face-to-face -face experiences that help you both gather and share information. You already participate in many of these, including att attendance at professional conferences like the one you're attending right now, professional learning communities in your school or district, study groups, grade level or content center meetings, and even your chats over lunch can help you teach others and learn from others. Online communities expand upon your face-to-face -face experiences and often expose you to different ways of doing things and sharing, whether it be teaching ideas, content enhancement, or finding a new website. A big part of demonstrating your leadership is your continued participation in online communities of practice. There are all types of interest-based communities. Ning, a self-created social network, has tons of educational networks. Some of the most popular are Classroom 2.0, and the Educators PLN. And in addition, there are many, many content-specific educational links also. EdWeb is another no-cost, created-on-your-own social network. They have sponsors for some of their communities, which allow them to offer real-time webinars, online chats, and much more. I happen to host the PD in Action community, which is sponsored by Follett Software Company. I blog here. I have discussions with over the 750 members. And I, ha and I have a popular online web presentation each month. You can even create your own network to help lead discussions in your district. Many ed tech companies have online communities made up of educators who either use their products to support teaching and learning or those that want to learn more about the products. These sites often include great lesson plans and activities. Some of these are hosted by Adobe, PBS, Scholastic, Discovery, and Google. Blogging can be another component of your leadership toolkit. You can read and subscribe to blogs, create your own, or even join a group blog. To subscribe to blogs, you need to use a newsreader, such as Google Reader shown here. Once you use a newsreader, you only have to visit a single place to find out about any new posts. However, the hardest part about following blogs is finding the ones that will help you the most. There are a couple of quick ways to do this. If you know an expert in your field's name, do a phrase search in Google on names blog and you will likely find a blog maintained by that person. Many bloggers include a blog role which is a list of blogs they follow right on their blog so you can check those out too. For instance here is the the uh, portion the A to E portion of Lucy's Gray's 
extensive blog role. So she's a great educator, full of great ideas, and she has tons and tons of blogs that she follows, so you can find some good ones there. There are several directories of edubloggers out there, too. The International Edu Edubloggers Directory and the list of education bloggers by discipline. Just like I talked about the Twitter list by discipline, there's also a blogger list by discipline. Once you spend some time reading and commenting on the blogs of others, you might decide to create your own. Most educators use Blogger, WordPress, or EduBlogs. Whichever one you use to make your blog, make sure to add it to these lists of educator-created blogs to make sure people come, visit, subscribe, and commenting on your blog. Comments are what, make, what creates part of the collaboration component of your personal learning network. You might also decide to create a group blog. A group blog is a blog with postings from various contributors. One example was started in 2007 and is now hosted by Education Week is called Leader Talk, which is a vibrant online community of superintendents, principals, educational leadership professors, and central office administrators. Anyone interested in posting can apply to participate. You can keep ahead of the curve via mainstream print media outlets also. Traditional print items can be analog or digital. It's important to keep up with mainstream media who both cover educational topics and upcoming tech innovations that can help support teaching and learning. I tend to keep up with the digital versions of the information since I find it gives me a much broader reach. By looking at mainstream media topics, I can expand my PLN outside of the regular education channels and get a different perspective on topics. Getting introduced to new ideas and finding other leaders can be easy if you participate in various types of professional development experiences also. Attending general education conferences or others that target your content area expertise can introduce you to both experts on a topic and other participants who have your same interest. Make sure you trade business cards, Twitter names, and email addresses to continue the conversation after the face-to-face -face conversation. Oftentimes at conferences, the face-to-face -face conversation is almost as good as the presentations. Many educational organizations and groups offer online webinars or, conference, webinars or conference presentations by experts. During the presentation, the best part is often the back channel, which is the conversation that is going on among participants while the presenter is presenting. This is often done in a chat area, and you can find some good resources and educators to work with right in those chats. Finding listings of these webinars is sometimes hard, but you wind up hearing about them from others in your area, your professional organizations, or those already in your personal learning network. One good place to find webinars to attend or view archived versions, which can include the chat area, is EdWeb. EdWeb is full of different communities, many of which offer the no-cost webinars. The webinars are archived and you can go view them at any time. It's a great starting point for a PLC. An unconference is a participant driven meeting. Many times these unconferences are held before a regularly scheduled national or regional conference since participants can come in a day early and attend the unconference. These are now sometimes called ed camps. One series of unconferences is edublogger.com, which is now called socialblogger.com. A small committee reserves a room, a mic, and table and chairs. On the day of the conference, the time periods are put on a large screen, and participants vote on topics for the day. Educators volunteer to lead and moderate these sessions. It's more of a conversation in these sessions than a presentation. Here are some of the presentations that were voted on and a group shot of the attendees at a recent edublogger.com at the National Tech Conference one year. At an unconference, you really have time to talk to others in an informal way and add them to your rapidly growing personal learning network. A workshop differs from a conference and is usually much smaller and project-based. For instance, a leader might give an overview of a topic and then small groups of participants will be asked to work together to create a product. You can easily make lasting friendships with those in your group as you work together to solve a problem and thus expand your personal learning network.
Of course, once you're comfortable with teaching others, teaching professional development workshops is a great way to find people who are interested in about the same topics you are. You can then create a Facebook group, Twitter list, or Google Plus circle to continue the conversation. There are other great tools that contain a social aspect which can be used to share resources. One way to get others to follow you is to create a poll and then share the results with others. One nice little survey site is called Flisty and it needs no sign up. Some other my, of my favorite poll makers include Google Forms, Poll Daddy, Survey Monkey, or my current favorite, Wufoo. A tool that allows you to create the framework, start the collection, and allow others to add to your collection, add your collection to their own shelf is LiveBinders. These have become very popular as a way to share resources and materials with others. Of course, one of the hot new tools that was not really intended for education but has taken off like gangbusters is Pinterest. Pinterest allows you to easily pin an item to a categorized board as seen here. Others can search on a topic, like this one on educational technology, and I can then easily add the sites to my own Pinterest board. And of course, if you create a wiki with resources for others on Wikispaces, you can give permission for anyone to join and add and edit the information directly on the wiki. This wiki was made for the sharing of resources. Another thing you can try with your colleagues is VIEW. V Y E W. View allows real time collaboration, include, including collaborative editing of documents, presentations using cameras and mics like this one, and annotation of items in order to teach or share information. There are formal places to stay ahead of the curve by reading important reports that come out each year. One of these is the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report. The Horizon Report publishes trends in educational technology for both K-12 and higher ed. The K-12 Report is a joint publication of the New Media Consortium, COSIN, and ISTE. The higher ed version is created by the New Media Consortium and ed EDUCAUSE. The report targets trends in the next year, two to three years, and four to five years out. It can help you understand the types of things that may be coming down the pike. In the upcoming year, the current Horizon Report for K-12 states that mobile devices and apps will be increasingly valued as important learning tools in K-12. Also, tablet computing will present new opportunities to enhance learning experiences in ways not possible with mobile phones, laptops, or desktop computers. Well, we know, certainly know that they're right on the mark with this. In the next two or three years, game-based learning will gain more traction as research continues to demonstrate its effectiveness for learning. Also, personal learning environments will provide our students with collections of tools and resources to support their own learning. And in four to five years, we can look forward to natural user interfaces, which allow computers to respond to gestures, motions of the body, facial expressions, voice sound, and other environmental clues. And also, augmented reality, which is the layering of information over a view of the normal world, will provide students with intuitive ways to access information that they can also control and manipulate in real time. So to lead change, you really need to stay knowledgeable about the things that are coming up. Now I've given you a lot of things to think about. On the left are the things you need to do to lead and effect change. On the right is the problem time. Time to read time to create, time to get everyone on board, time to teach, time to learn, time to share. You do not have to start with everything at once. Start with one thing to both consume and create or participate in. Get really good at it. You cannot convince others to use technology to support teaching and learning unless they see that you are really comfortable with it. And that brings us to the last point about leading change. Pay it forward. There is just one word that you have to remember, share. Share the things that work, share the things that don't, share what you accidentally find out, and share your thoughts and vision. This is not just sharing with those that you are leading, this is with the educators in your PLN. Don't be afraid to share. Your new knowledge will always help others become better. Here is my contact information again and a link to the URL.
And now I'll take time for questions. Thank you. So I'm back now. I hope you enjoyed that look at a personal learning network. And I hope it gave you some ideas and didn't overwhelm you, but some ideas how to increase your reach and to find really, really good people to follow so you gain new information. Thank you very much.